And this next subject is a um, subject that's near and dear to my heart, yacht management. It's how I cut my teeth in this business. And the first yachts that I was managing, uh, interestingly enough, were mostly these big racing maxi sloops for owners uh, whose owners were members of the New York Yacht Club. And we were managing them where we were doing, we were pretending they were big charter yachts when they, all they were doing was these big round the world races and all that. But that was a lot of fun. That was a good way to learn. But um, the uh, yacht management refit process, a day in the life of a yacht manager, and this is Michael Reardon of Reardon Yacht Consulting, somebody I've known for many, many, many years. He uh, started out uh, as a boat builder, then as a yacht captain, as yacht manager for over 20 years. He did stretches, which sounds like uh, sentences, sent stretches with a couple of, uh, like 11 years with Frazier's, seven years with Hill Robinson. And I noticed coincidentally, I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but he doesn't put in his bio notes that he also worked for Bob Saxon Associates as my yacht manager for many, many years. And to his credit, he has also managed uh, such mega yachts as Charade, Medusa, Catatouche, and Octopus. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Reardon, and make, make sure you corner him later on and have him tell you a story about how he lost a job on a 112 Delta. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And uh, it wasn't intentional why I didn't say I didn't work uh, for Bob Saxon Associates. It just, you get so many names after a while. Um, hey, I'm hoping to do something a little bit more interactive and have you guys uh, take a test. And uh, if you would, since all of us are using our phones here, why don't you go to a website now, and it's poll, the word poll, P-O-L-L-E-V, poll, E-V, like everywhere, poll, E-V.com, and then forward slash S-U-M-M, -M, some. So we're going to be doing some online polling. And uh, first question, really, I want to... Uh, ask is uh, up here and it should when you go to that website on your device it should pop up if you go again pollev.com forward slash sum and then the question is what do you think yacht management is and the answers or the options are and you'll see it on your phone if it's working is it working anyone got it yes yes okay some people got it someone voted so, and that's the co cool thing with Poll Everywhere. It kind of does it instantly uh, if the technology is working. So, somebody thinks uh, acting as an offshore, uh, sorry, acting as part of a family office offshore. Someone's saying all the above. Yeah. And so, um, there we go. Some people. Some people kind of get it, and some people don't. Do you know if you put, if you just go in a website right now and put in Yacht Management, do you know what you get? A company called Yacht Management here, I don't know if anyone from that company is in EBA or uh, here, but, okay, but it's absentee, it's that first one, you know, taking care of smaller boats where there's an absentee owner, and uh, you need the boat washed and prepped and all that stuff. But the yacht management we're really going to be talking about today is the, four, the people that, that greater than 80 feet. And, um, and uh, yeah, you guys keep pulling away. And, and we're going to take a look at what yacht management on bigger boats really is. Um, so really, what, what, what does a yacht manager do, and uh, especially when I'm introduced to people outside this industry, and people say, what do you do? I say I'm a property manager, and it's really kind of, so what's a property? Anyway, it's a remote piece of property, and, and what are the components of taking care of that in uh, a boat? Well, the biggest part really is money. And I, there's been so many great presentations today, and I, I think, was it, was it Billy that said that um, the greatest redistribution of wealth is you know, this industry? Well, as a as a yacht manager, boats that have million and multi-million dollar budgets, I'm kind of the guy writing those checks uh, to vendors out there and, and to people that help us out. We write a few checks to Steel and some other uh, people that help us with getting boats in the country. I've got a captain right now that was freaking out. It's his first uh, captain's job and he doesn't have a cruising permit. And he's like, whoa, how do I move the boat? I don't have a cruising permit. Well. I think you all are aware, and, and uh, uh, are you going to give us an update on that? 
Uh, yeah, an update on what's going on with cruising permits. They've made it kind of a pain in the, yeah, now uh, to, to uh, and, and we'll see what's going on there. But a lot of taking care of a boat, uh, doing yacht management is taking care of the money. And, and uh, uh, doing that well uh, as a company, even though it's a company that basically spends money, uh, is really important. It's uh, the most important thing as far as building trust with a client, um, as far as them uh, um, feeling comfortable with uh, using their boat and what's going on. Then we've got the very famous uh, crew from, what's that TV show called that, uh, yeah, wow. Um, I, I have to confess, I've never seen it. Um, captain's an old, that, that, that particular captain's an old friend of mine. I actually fired him from a job, which obviously didn't uh, matter. It turned out well for him. But uh, taking, crew, uh, taking care of crew is really important. Depending on the size of the boat and the application, we have a million things to deal with. The contracts that are going to be used on that boat, that's a charter boat, I, what, and that boat I think was, yeah, chartering maybe in the Caribbean in the show. I'm not sure where, but if you're, you know, depending if you're operating commercially or privately, whether you're over a certain tonnage, the contracts that are necessary, uh, the unpleasant job of firing people and making sure that's done right. i um, going to uh, look at a few questions about what's involved there. And then just logistics of whether a boat's getting hauled out of the water, whether it's dealing with their certificates. Um, again, Crystal is working with us on this five-year survey of a 130-foot Westport. And it's really not rocket science, but putting all the pieces together and, and having someone who really knows the inside tract of who to talk to. And the only purpose this boat is going in the yard this year is for this survey. The owners want the boat in Boston. They want it there as quickly as possible. And the captain said, ah, you're going to have to give me two months. Well, doing it well, we're getting it done in less than a month. Um, and uh, what they could have asked us to do, literally, uh, any uh, sea valve where, you know, is going overboard seawaters, they can say, no, we want you to take that out. We want to inspect it. We want to put it on a pressure test. And uh, I don't know if you, if you know how the boats are built now, but very often those valves are not in a spot you can get to very easily and are not ever meant to come out again. So being able to walk through that stuff and find a reasonable way of, hey, you know, if we go to Home Depot and buy one of those little cameras with the tube and you stick it up the tube and take a look at the valve and see that it's closing correctly, um, Mr. Surveyor, you okay with that instead of us ripping the boat apart? Yes, and that's a great way to do things efficiently. So there's not just the day-to-day -day of, hey, there's a dock we need to get to and do that kind of stuff, but then there's the bigger things and uh, refits that do get both expensive and need some planning. So logistics and daily operations. And then really the most important thing that the owners really don't want every time they come on to get a safety briefing and all that stuff, but our job is keeping them safe. And our job, especially for the boats that are over a certain tonnage, over 500 tons, which would be about uh, the, uh, I can't remember, but on that TV show, one of the boats is the old charade, which is called BG, I think. And that boat, 155-foot uh, uh, fed ship was uh, 515 tons. So a boat about that size, 163 foot Trinity, uh, 164 foot uh, Westport, those boats are right on the edge of 500 tons. Once you're over 500 tons, life changes as far as documentation and the amount of paperwork and all you're going through. But whether a boat's over 500 tons or under 500 tons, our main job is keeping people safe. Fortunately, unlike planes, when you do that badly, um, people die usually. But in yachting, um, you know, a boat ends up on the beach in Palm Beach or somebody ends up in the paper for being drunk and doing something stupid and stuff like that. It's usually not quite as dramatic, but it's really important. So financial, uh, I'm not going to repeat it because time's short and you guys want to have drinks. Um, uh, crew management, Again, hiring and terminations. We're trying to, we go, we hire a lot of crew. 
And you guys know that um, crew, when they get on a boat, they stay for like 15 years? No. Uh, uh, a deckhand, on a big boat, a deckhand or a stewardess, if they last a season, we're doing okay. And we're trying to get into doing stuff a little bit more efficiently. We work with a lot of crew agencies, but we're trying to get uh, people to do uh, remote questions on video. So our uh, HR folks, our lady, does some questions and says, now you gotta go in front of your computer and you'd be amazed. You know, there's a, a, a pretty girl or a, a decent looking guy that looks like he just got out of bed. His hair is kind of all over, he kind of slurs and he's answering these questions like, man, come on, dress up, look a little decent, look like you, it's really the, the, the workforce that was being talked about in the uh, industry of building boats it's really as tough in, in our industry too, especially young people not understanding the process of what's involved. And then all the documentation, payroll. If the boat's in the United States for over half the year, they really need to be going through a US payroll system, which guess what? Crew don't like it when you take taxes out of their uh, pay. And um, you know, novel concept in yachting with crew is you have to pay taxes. They don't like it. So if you're out of the country more than half the year, a lot of times we do payroll offshore. And if you're a large yacht, uh, very often it's not only offshore, it's leasing them back and meeting these uh, regulatory requirements. So a lot of stuff with that. So now to see what, if anybody knows anything about this. Okay, Maritime Labor Convention is the MLC, which is uh, the overarching, is it IMO, Peter? that the MLC comes from? ILO. Uh, uh, ILO, uh, International Labor Organization. This is the, this is the uh, convention that requires a boat over 500 tons. Hey, you've got to use a certain contract. So employment agreements required for a non-US flag yacht. Wh what do you think? So yeah, somebody just said yacht over 500. Someone says a charter yacht, but then changed their mind. Uh, so I'm going to change their mind again and again. Um, I didn't know I, there was a thing that you could click that said you can change your mind. But uh, uh, so you guys, you know, you're kind of getting it. So yachts, these yachts that are over 155 feet or so, over 500 tons, they have to have that uh, document. That document is not just kind of a pain in the neck of a lot of paper. That has to be certified by the flag that you're flying. So a Cayman flag needs to improve to approve your Cayman SEA that you're gonna be issuing for all those crew people. And very often they're gonna be in a leaseback situation uh, and paid offshore. So a lot of uh, stuff that goes along with that that's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, by law, is the owner manager required to fly a fired crew member to their home country? And a lot of people changing their mind there. A lot of yeses, some noes, and actually no one's given the right answer. It depends. It depends. Um, which is a horrible answer. There you go. Woo. Woo. <laughs> you guys are nailing it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so uh, amazing how smart you guys get. Um, so uh, here, here's the thing, I, I, was, I, I used to do this uh, training thing, Bob and I were with um, uh, Super Yacht Society and, uh, and they did these training seminars at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show, Rob Moss and a bunch of esteemed people were on a panel and I'm up there moderating a panel saying, you know, we fire crew all the time and if they quit, we don't, we make them pay and Rob's like, you're going to jail, man. That's not, that's not legal. Um, now with the SEAs, there's a little bit of a nuance with that. In general, um, if you fire someone, uh, you fly them home. So we got a South African crew member here. Uh, he's terminated. Um, if it says on his contract that his termination point is Johannesburg, we're paying that for that flight. If he quits, um, or if he's terminated for cause, and that's usually something pretty heavy duty. Gets in a fight with the captain, 
uh, gets called out for being drunk a couple times, doesn't show up for work or something. It's pretty rare that it happens, but he gets terminated for cause. You can actually deduct up to a thousand, is it? A thousand dollars? Dollars out of his pay, out of his final pay. But you can't make him pay. You got to get him there and then take it out of his pay. So again, kind of a pain in the neck and stuff we uh, regularly have to deal with. So um, operational day uh, and technical is really, again, everything from, I, so uh, here's the biggest boat I take care of right now is a 220-foot Bonetti, smallest boats, an 80-foot, uh, and a, I'll just say a sort of 80-foot-ish boat with a very young owner that the demographic, uh, Jonathan and the demographic, you know, here's, uh, a 32-year-old buying his first yacht. It's an 80-something foot yacht. He buys it right before Christmas. Um, we start working with him a couple months ago, and the captain calls me a couple weeks ago and says, hey, Mike, uh, the boss showed up, and he's got two uh, sea dues. I'm like, uh, what do you mean he's got two sea dues? Oh, he went to North Miami Motorsports and bought two sea dues. And I'm like, where are they going? Like, well, they're not going on the boat because there's no room for them. And so now the boss calls me and says, hey, Mike, I want to take the boat up to New England. Get the wave runners up there for me. I'm like, well, OK. So we put them on a truck or you know, ship them up there to Falmouth. So you can. And then he says, no, I really, uh, you know what? We, we, had, uh, we had made reservations in Boston. We were going to have them delivered there. He goes, nah, change that plan. I want to kind of go all over the place. So. Make that happen for me. I want the wave runner or the, the sea dues to go with me. I'm like, what are you talking about? So we put together a $20,000 budget for buying a trailer, getting a 20-some-year-old kid to go in his truck and follow this yacht around New England. So there's some really weird things yacht managers are at times and yacht brokers are asked to do. And it, you know, at first it was like, okay, we shipped the wave runners up to, but then we actually got involved in the purchase transaction. Then we called the insurance company, or actually the guy's assistant called the insurance company and got it on the yacht policy. And all the insurance people here are going, whoa, wait a minute. You're going to put wave runners that are normally called, what's that fancy word, appurtenance? That means it's with the mothership. Now they're just winging around separately on a trailer. They're like, whoa, different scenario. That goes from costing $5 extra to $5,000 extra. And what about the trailer and the truck and the kid driving it and all that stuff? It becomes uh, sort of a, a, a bit of a nightmare for us as far as managing it. But the guy wants to do it, so we make it happen. Try to inform him of the risks of what might be involved. But at the same time, hey, we're here to help someone enjoy yachting. So that's what we try to do. The rest of the stuff, you know, five-year refits and all that stuff, there's lots and lots that goes on every day in a yacht management office that, to say it, there's never a boring moment. There are a lot of sort of all of a sudden someone screaming at you because we, their internet is down and they're on a one-month cruise on the boat. And we don't have any control of how the internet's working on the yacht, but we're the managers and we're responsible for trying to make all that stuff happen. And then there's the, the legal stuff. Um, on a, kind of on a more serious note, and this ended up being lawyers and insurance companies and, and it gets, it gets uh, involved and a bit heavy, but we're about to take over the management of a 130 foot boat uh, the one management company has been notified. We've been informed. We're taking over a week before we start. Captain calls and says, hey, Mike, first mate, he just began, was up on the upper deck, fell off, had no uh, harness on or anything. He slipped and fell, landed on the tide rider on his head, broke his skull, had a stroke. He's now in the hospital dying. Like, wow, um, help. So, um, so that ended up being a situation where uh, get the, the, the crew member to the hospital, find out that he hasn't been signed up for health insurance yet. And the yacht's insurance to cover the crew requires there to be something called health insurance in place. 
So now it's like, wow, this is getting kind of crazy complicated. And a lot of good people in this room uh, were either involved or people we all know that made the health insurance fall into place. The guy goes to the hospital, he gets stabilized. 120,000 pounds later, a Lufthansa jet is modified to take out 10 seats and they put in this hospital unit. And that young man is flown home to England uh, for a multi-year recovery. And uh, we not only follow that all the way along, and British Marine, the underwriter, has a guy that just keeps showing up and checking on this guy and seeing how his recovery is going, he goes through therapy, and he ends up back on yachts, working on yachts. He wasn't whole. He wasn't whole. But uh, life can get kind of serious and complicated sometimes in the process. Most of the time, not. But that's all in, and you know, there are lawyers involved. He didn't sue. But in the end, he was given a, a, a settlement because he had permanent loss. Yes, Crystal? Why do you got that spinner thing? <laughs> Teasing. Yeah, but uh, again, yeah, playing dev that, that could have happened. But the uh, sort of goodwill along the way made both uh, the insurers and all the people that came into place to make it happen well go really well. And, you know, and the best result was that he actually did recover, which is from a, a severe brain injury is pretty, pretty miraculous and unusual. So that's operational. Okay, so now going into a shipyard. Here we go. Yacht falls over in the shipyard and the captain has signed the shipyard contract without consulting the insurance company, what is the potential outcome? What do you think? Tell me on your phones. So while you guys are answering, here's something I really want, if, if there's one thing to take away from this, because you brokers are involved in a very uh, delicate moment in a transaction when it comes out of the water for that thing called a survey, someone's got to sign a piece of paper that says, boat's out of the water and we're paying. And when they sign that piece of paper, there are um, things called, uh, the, the legal word is exculpatory clauses. There, and I'm exaggerating here, and please, for any shipyards, I'm not trying to be uh, insulting or mean. But to protect themselves, shipyards often say something like, when you sign this document, we're not responsible for anything, even if your boat falls out of our lift. And um, the insurance company says, mm, you can't sign that piece of paper without letting us know. Is it, Basically, that's what they say, right, Carrie? And so all of a sudden, they, there's this piece of paper that somebody signed that says, we're responsible for everything. And unintentionally, and again, I'm using sort of strong words, you voided or potentially voided the insurance on the boat, and now it falls. Big problem, big problem. I was the yacht manager. Um, of a boat called Teleos when it fell over uh, at Director Shipyard many, many years ago. It was a $3 million repair from a boat just going 163 foot fed ship. So, um, and, and the wording back then, it kind of, you know, now with lawyers being more involved, you got to be super, super careful with that. The smartest thing to do is pick that thing up and actually read it, even though it's hard to read. Find those clauses, send it to Carrie or your insurance underwriter or your insurance broker and go, ooh. And you know, a lot of insurance policies actually require that now. And I go into shipyards with this and I offer alternate wording, which uh, attorneys would say, I shouldn't do that because that's practicing law, but I'm just trying to make stuff work, you know, and get things done. And, um, and, Either that wording is acceptable to insurers, the shipyard, and everyone else, or you've got an issue, and you've got to deal with that. And sometimes the simplest solution is just the insurance company says, hey, for an additional premium, who's going to pay, you know, the owner? 
uh, or whoever you decide and negotiate. Um, for an additional premium, we will cover that liability. Or the wording changes so that uh, the insurer doesn't feel like it's so one-sided and uh, putting an undue burden on them. So that's another part of life as a yacht manager. The shipyard, uh, one of my, my dearest friends is a salesman at a shipyard, and he's like, Michael, you know, you're the only person that makes us go through that. And I'm thinking, man, you know, that's not, <laughs> the, the problem remains, whether I'm the only person doing it or not. The liability's out there, and fortunately, we don't have many accidents, but um, we're kind of setting ourselves up for a bit of a disaster uh, if one happens, especially in that specific area. Uh, safety management, I've kind of given you the example, but um, let me put it this way. The boats over 500 tons require ISM, and again, um, you were saying initials and they drive you crazy. In International Safety Management Code. International Safety Management Code is very simple words for generically what's known as a quality management system. A quality management system takes a look at something complicated and says, you know what? We need to write down how we do what we do so that we do it correctly. And whether you know it or not, when you get in your car and put on your seatbelt and put it in drive and look around, but that's a procedure. It's just now we're saying, you know, when we dock, when we undock, when we lift up a tender, when we do something where we could harm someone, we need to write stuff down. And uh, a boat over 500 tons, there's lots of regulations that go with that. You have to be audited uh, by the flag and by your manager um, and then go through a class uh, that usually is all at one time each year. And then if you're not, it's just smart to have that system in place to have a safety system. There's uh, lots of certificates that you have to take care of for both the yacht, the crew, and then you gotta know what to do when the cuckoo hits the fan with a real emergency. Um, uh, DPA is a designated person ashore, that's usually me, uh, in, in my management company, and uh, even though I, well, actually, I have a partner in Europe who's a much smarter guy with a, uh, unlimited masters and a and a class one engineering, and he, for our bigger boats, takes care of that, and, and we have a whole uh, emergency system to take care of. This is just one part of a, uh, a certificate data sheet that goes down a list um, of many, many items, and the red and the, the, the colors are kind of whether you need it or not for that size boat. But each yacht we take in, we go through this kind of complicated form of all the pieces of paper uh, you need. And those pieces of paper generally have uh, something relevant or important that you can't just blow off. Okay, so emergencies. In a real emergency, what's the most important thing to remember? What do you think? Keep talking to whoever is on the phone and try to keep them calm, don't panic. Use training to ascertain the help needed or follow emergency questions. Um, I, I uh, left my wallet in my backpack, but in my wallet is a little laminated piece of paper. When I receive a phone call, hey, we're having a real emergency, uh, or whether it's a drill, there is a series of questions. Where are you? What's the nature of your emergency? Uh, really important stuff to do, um, and, uh, and, and again, I've dealt with, uh, in, in the crazy early days, well, Bob will be happy to share with you a story of me getting fired from a boat for, and I wasn't quite fired, but I should have been, uh, for water skiing behind a boat between, a big yacht between uh, Nassau and Chubb, and the boss accidentally seeing a video that uh, before there was viral uh, things on the internet, saw a video that I had forgotten to tell him I had done that. But um, you just don't do those things anymore in this day of yachting. And you know, way back when, when I first became a yacht manager, drunken crew, Jeep falls over with seven people hanging out of a Jeep and one of the crew members' face happens to be between the pavement and the windshield as it tipped over and it skids across the ground and sort of half of his face is gone and we don't have uh, emergency procedures at the time but we gotta figure out a way to help him. Having those, having a little bit more of a, of a plan and a program now is really important. 
the guy that falls off the boat. We have one incident. I have a client for eight years. When he bought the yacht, he said, Michael, would you get the exercise machine uh, uh, elliptical up there? I help. We get four guys from the crew. The thing's carried from a storage warehouse. It goes, into, uh, goes down Sunrise Harbor docks, gets lifted up by the crane. On Two days later, the engineer goes, ah, oh, my back hurts. Eight years later, the guy's now an oxycodone addict. Uh, the uh, court case for the crew member suing the owner has, has lasted where he just doesn't do anything, but as it's about to expire with whatever you call statute of limitations, the, uh, our, our attorney or the owner's attorney has to give them notice that, hey, it's about to, and he just re, uh, he keeps it going on and on forever and ever and ever. Knowing what to do in a real emergency uh, and documenting that and stuff is really important these days. And again, it's rare. I don't want to over uh, dramatize. What, there's a lot of stuff day to day that's really boring that we do. Um, just, you know, but there's other things that, um, I get a lot more involved. Um, you guys selling boats, that's what most of you are here for. You know, it's, the, it, it's using the, the tools that you're here to learn and sell boats. Yacht management is, uh, we actually, you know, you guys have a, a very significant liability for the life of the deal and doing that well and professionally. Uh, the, every day we manage a yacht, uh, I can do something wrong. And I've made plenty of mistakes. Uh, back at Frazier, uh, we forgot, we inherited a boat in management. I forgot to look at the insurance policy. The boat went uh, through the Panama Canal and into the Gulf of Tehuantepec and a $150,000 tender it was towing gets lost. We submit the claim to uh, David Allen and David comes back to me and goes, Michael, uh, boat's not supposed to be in the Pacific Ocean right now. I'm like, ooh, shit. No, I didn't, yes, I probably did say that. And, um, the, and Fraser Yachts had, um, what, what do you call it when you have insurance against making a mistake? E and O, yeah, errors and omissions. And we went to that and they're like, no, we're not paying. The contract says the, ins the, uh, the owner's responsible. Your yacht management contract says the owner's responsible. Well, in practice, yeah, the owner's responsible, but he expected us to cover it and we ended up paying and lost the client. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, um, there's stuff that we do that we're exposed to every day that we actually do need a system and be a little bit smart. The job is trying to help owners enjoy their yachts and have a good time um, and be safe. Um, you know, a crazy 32 year old with two, you know. So to finish the story on the wave runners. So he buys the wave runners and the captain goes, Mike, not only did the guy just show up with two wave runners, but he crashed the wave runner into the yacht. First thing he does, bringing it up to the back of the boat. So we've got lots of excitement um, with clients like that, but that guy is very likely to go up in size, and if we can keep him happy and alive, uh, be, be a, a really good client uh, down the road for other people. So uh, I think that's it for what I've got for today. Um, <laughs> any questions? Perfect. <laughs> but various of these things for owners. Now, I always warn yacht brokers, you shouldn't get into the management business, shouldn't get, shouldn't get into the maintenance business for your owners or anything like that because the liability is sticking your neck out. If something goes wrong, it's you. If you give it to a yacht manager and he screws up, you can always blame him. <laughs> but if you are the broker and you're managing yachts, quasi magic, you think you're endearing yourself to the client and you're doing it for free, you're really sticking your neck out for very little in return. All right, thanks, Mike. That was great stuff. All right.